John 3, perhaps one of the most profound chapters in the Bible. I think every chapter is profound if you allow the Holy Spirit really to show you. But we know John 3, and John 3 contains, well, perhaps one of the most quoted. I know it isn't the most quoted, but it's up there. Uh, star rating John 3, 16. You see it all over the place. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Profound, great. You know, the whole chapter is intense it's full of spiritual knowledge and spiritual insight. You can sit and read it over and over again, and it becomes more and more profound as the years go by. What interests me, and this has got no doctrinal value at all, but I love the King James Version. I really do love the King James Version. Whenever I need to check on anything, I go back to the kings. I love the these and thous and, and the beseeches and all that. It seems to have a lot more uh, a, a meaning and feeling than them. But this is just an interesting sidelight that in the King James Version, John 3.16 has 25 words. You know that. It has 25 words. And the interesting part about it is that right in the middle, the 13th, is the sun that he gave his son. That is the 13th one. It's right in the middle. And it's not doctrinally of any value, but it's just interesting to me. So that's 12 before and 12 after, and central is Jesus. And, and I love that. Central is Jesus. And the, the first 12 represent uh, the 12 tribes, for me. There they are. And the second lot uh, represent the 12 apostles. There they are. And right in the center, so you have the tribes, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and right slap bang in the middle is the sun. And I, I, I love that. Uh, I know in other versions there are more words, and in other languages there probably like, it, there's no significance, but it really just spoke to me. And it's, it's very important. And somehow, you know, we've taken that, the sun, the only begotten, uh, Jesus is absolutely the core. We all know that. Uh, but right down, and, and, and at the end in Revelation 5, verse 8, it talks about all those 24 bowing down in front of the Lord eventually one day. And it really is all about that. It really is all about that. But we have taken John 3, 16. And I want to just deal with that first before I go into John 3. But John 3.16, we've taken that, and I do believe, and please hear me clearly, I do believe that we have placed the wrong emphasis on the word so. God so loved the world. Almost today, John 3.16, I hear it quoted, they don't even do the whole thing. They just say, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And the emphasis is placed on the word so. And what we really need to know is that it actually gives us a wrong understanding of the whole thing. Because God most definitely, and the world tries to persuade us, even the church today, God is absolutely not about one way doting love. For human beings. It's not a so, it's not a hyperbole. God, so, it's not about one way doting love for human beings. You see, we often say, and I hear people talking about compassion, and they say, well, God is a God of compassion. And yeah, and I say, well, that's, that's the same thing. So loves compassion. But if you actually look at the, at, the, at the dictionary, and the dictionary tells you what compassion is, compassion is not doting love. Not at all. Compassion in the dictionary is pity inclining one to help and be merciful. That is what compassion 
means. And that is certainly not a doting father. It does not convey it in that. The wrong emphasis, for God so loved, God so. Now, what we need to understand is that the so is not a hyperbole. So is actually meaning in like manner. In like manner. That's what it means. Because if we read verse 14, it says, as, as Moses, in some translation it says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so, in like manner, putting on the cross, in like manner, as previously said in verses 14 and 15, not a hyperbole, God in like manner, so he loved. Now their love is agape love. It's agape love. It's a love that you and I don't understand. It's a self-giving personal commitment irrespective of grateful response. A God love we do not understand, can't understand, and can't compare humanly. He loved us so much. He loved us with this, this, this agape love, which is a sacrificial love. He so loved the world, which, which is the, the, the cosmos. In like manner, he loved the cosmos, which is what he made, his creation, his system, the toy that he created, the complex sort of orderly system with gravity and all his principles. He did. And so, so is so overstressed. If we can read it possibly like this. For God... In the like same manner, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, sacrificed his son for his creation, all who believe will not perish, which means go to hell, but have eternal life. Now that makes a big difference. It really makes a big difference if you understand. It's a statement of fact. For God, so in like manner, like the serpent on the, on, on, lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, sacrificed his son for his creation, and all who believe and believing is an ongoing verb, which is believing and obeying at the same time. All who believe will not perish. And perish is a very, very strong word. Perish means go to hell. Will not perish. So in this great statement of love, God is just telling us, it's not a hyperbole that tells us about doting love at all. It's just classically. And you know, it's interesting. If you look today... And I don't highly recommend, but I, you look in some of the other Bible translations. Uh, uh, the Passion Bible, for instance, it's just interesting that it should... John, it, it translates John 3.16 as this, For here is the way God loved the world. He gave His only unique Son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in Him will never perish, but experience eternal life. For here is the way, in like manner, God loved the world. He sacrificed. He said, the New Living Translation, it actually says, for this is how God loved the world. And it's important for us to understand because we have got this thing so caught up, so overstressed the, the love issue and please don't get me wrong it's an agape love it's an incredible thing that God should love us and God should do what he did do no question about that but it does not mean we can't throw it in 
with the whole issue of, of a cheap grace and God so loved as a doting father. We need to understand more, and we will see as we look at John 3, we'll see how this whole thing works. Love is not how we understand it. It's so much more than us. And the bottom line, the big bottom line, is that the Bible and all of this is about God. It's not about you and me. Really, we need to understand we've got to get through, not only in your presentation of the gospel, but in your own understanding. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. It's the revelation of God. Uh, as, as Paul said, the gospel is the revelation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's all about God. And I mean the word perish. If you look in the dictionary, it says, be destroyed, suffer death. Sure. A very, very strong word. Suffer death and ruin, be destroyed. In fact, go to hell. You see, telling the world, I've been in the ministry about 40 years. And in the early days, I used to, I used to say, you know, going around, and this is what we did do, going around the world, telling them, telling everyone that God loves them. Do you know it makes no difference to the people whatsoever? So if God loves me, what have I got to do about it? God's a doting father. God loves you. It doesn't matter what you do. That's not true. It's not true. Absolutely not true. And what it does, because you do the same thing with your kids, you just give them that doting love, and all they end up is becoming more petulant, more demanding. I find it just breeds brats. I'm sorry, that's what's going on. Breeding brats. In the early church, there were self-indulged people. People with a, a sort of uh, a, a, the entitlement syndrome. Entitlement brats. That's, that is what's going on. I'm sorry. And it's all because there's a wrong emphasis in the understanding of this. The disciples and the early church, you go and have a look. They preach righteousness. The gospel is about righteousness. It's about holiness. It's about repentance unto salvation. It's not about you and me and our comfort. It's about Jesus. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. Oswald Chambers says, Jesus, unfortunately, is portrayed as a figurehead of a religion, a mere example. He is infinitely more than that. He is salvation itself. He is the gospel of God. Jesus isn't a magic word, a magic password. He isn't a magic genie. He's not a key as a mantra. And what I'm trying to say is that John 3.16, first of all, John 3.16 on its own, but, but in context, John 3.16 needs John 14 and 15, and, and I'll show you, it needs 17 and 18 and 19. The text needs a context, and the whole thing needs the whole chapter. For God, our awesome, awesome creator, and it's all helped to modernly undermine the fear of God. I don't think we do it. I remember once really feeling God tell me that I'm playing games with the awesomeness of God. I wasn't playing games on purpose. I wasn't doing it intentionally. 
but we've just been sucked in to presenting this a doting father and a cheap grace. And then we wonder why we end up with brats. I don't know, someone obviously must have been worried, but I think particularly uh, the, 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 the devil he saw a, 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 a wonderful opportunity here about parading God as a, a, a tyrant and all that. Somehow we have felt that we've got to make some difference. We've got to undermine this whole thing. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But it's a proper fear. It's not a fear of the rules and regulations. It's a fear that has to do with his awesomeness. He is utterly, utterly awesome. I have never, ever seen God as a monstrous tyrant. Never in my life. I had a wonderful relationship with my father, and I've always seen God as the father. God the father. And my dad was strict, and there was, uh, there was no arguments or debates. It was yes or no, and that was it. Not any arguments and debates, and I trusted him implicitly. God is not an ogre. God doesn't need a PR job. He doesn't need a new image. God gave each one of us our own will. I mean, that's not a tyrant. He gave every one of us our own will. The only downside of your own will is that finally one day you reap the consequences of your own will. You are what you choose to be whether you want to believe it or not. Everyone in this room, you are all exactly where you have chosen to be in your relationship with God. You say, well, God has left you out of that. We are the only problem. You are exactly precisely where you have chosen to be in your relationship with God. God loved us. He gave us Jesus. We are not saved by love. We are not saved by grace. We're saved by Jesus. But Jesus is love and he is grace. We're not saved by his attributes. We are not saved by concepts or philosophies. We are saved by Jesus. It begins and it ends there. All authority, all access, all forgiveness. Jesus is all sufficient. God's love is the gift of Jesus. Jesus is love. No greater love than that someone should die for you. And nobody has died for any of you except that Jesus has died for the lot of us. The whole lot of us. And it says there, if you don't believe, in that wonderful verse, it says, if you don't believe, you perish. And then it goes on to say, and I'll read in verses 17, 18, and 19, that if you don't believe, you remain condemned. We were all born condemned thanks to Adam and Eve. We were all born sinners, Adamic. And you remain condemned. So you're born condemned. You're born condemned and you remain condemned unless you believe. And believing isn't just saying, you know, I think that's right. Believing is believing it with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and appropriating that truth in your life. Getting born again. He also says at the end of John, the wrath of God remains upon you. Believe it or not, you're born with the wrath of God on you. And it remains on you until you choose to get out of it. Believe is a continuous verb. Continuous verb, believing and obeying all at the same time. 
And then the great emphasis, the summing up, we like John 3, 16. 19 is, is, is the summing up of it all, and I'm going to bring it into context now, now. He sums it all up and says, this is the condemnation. The light came into the world, and the world received him not. Key verse is number 19. This is the lot. This is the verdict. This is the condemnation that you did not believe. And when are we going to understand that belief, unbelief, is the father of all sins? It's the original sin that produced all the other sins. It's the only sin that Jesus didn't die for. And the consequence of unbelief is hell and damnation. As I've often said to you when people ask me, how do you get to hell? I say, easy, you just keep walking. We were born on that road. You're born in the valley of the shadow of death. And unless you turn to Jesus properly, not just recognize that it might have happened, The great gospel duty is to believe. And holiness is separation unto God. It's, it's not piety. It's not about being a holy Joe, having a halo and a harp, being smiley and huggy. Jesus died for the Father. We are the undeserved beneficiaries. I mean, grace definition, we've changed it all. Just, it's unmerited favor. We sang about that this morning. Unmerited favor. We deserve nothing. But he gave it to us. Undeserving. Jesus became a curse by divine decree. He came and died for his father, God ordained that. You know the prodigal son? We know. He ended up in the pigsty. He wanted to do his own thing. And then he came to an amazing revelation there when he saw the pigs and smelt the pigs and heard the oink oinks. He came to this amazing revelation. I have sinned. I am the biggest problem that I have. I am. And it changed his life. And even when we preach about the prodigal son, we talk about the father's arms are always open. And they are. That's the amazing thing about God. But the father's arms being open doesn't help you one iota unless you make a decision about him and realize that you are a sinner. You see, God is always there. But you've got to do something about it. And the important thing is that you won't seriously do anything about it until you seriously realize your need for it. And you won't appreciate your need until someone tells you that. If everyone tells you that you're fine, you're in trouble. It's a deception. The Holy Spirit convicts on sin, righteousness, and judgment and glorifies Jesus Christ as the only way home. We have gone sadly overboard, presuming God's doting love. We have gone overboard, and we've messed it up. There's a balance in this whole thing, but we've messed it up. The kindness and the sternness of God, we've messed it up because we've come to our own interpretation and we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to bring us to the right understanding of it all. Let me read John 3, now, just in the context of all that. Now, listen to this. It is absolutely profound. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, 
We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that is born of the Spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered, Listen to it. Listen to the tone. And he said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Sure. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came from heaven, and that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Sure, that costs a whole new idea and understanding of what God was saying. We just take John 3.16 and we take the first part of the thing. For God so loved as he had over and over. And then we wonder why. Because we've taken all our doctrine, and don't get me wrong, God is a God of incredible love, but we need to understand what that love means and what it is. The words of Jesus, all of what I read to you there is in red. All of it is in red. The characters, the people, the incidents, the words, all divinely ordained, carefully chosen, because God is meticulous. God is down to the finest intricate details. Just have a look at the temple de details and the, the genealogies. And then we had Nicodemus, and it's interesting. Nicodemus, Pharisee, wealthy, educated, leader, ruler, impressive CV, probably admired, respected, influential. Christian. He came at night. Why? Because he feared man. He was scared of his peers. And those Nicodemuses, they scared. They're scared of their peers. Even today, the, the church leaders are scared. They're scared of the world here. There are a few exceptions, but they're scared. Scared of the peer, a coward. Scared of majority public ecclesiastical opinion. Scared. Scared of what's going. Feared political, cultural, social correctness. Everything was dictated by that. 
it is so highly representative of much of the leadership today. Rich, influential, respectable, but no moral courage whatsoever. Why? No fear of God in the land. No fear of God, and it's not helped by everyone preaching the first half of John 3.16. No fear of God. Absolutely. The doctrine, it's the sort of easy, resistance-free, friendly way with no costs. The modus operandi, favor and flattery. I'm sorry, moral and ethical cowards, individually and corporately. The power of money. Oh, it is so powerful. Even God says there's only one opposition to him, and that's mammon. And the power of money. Oh, you look around. It's all over the place. It's just oozing out of every place. It's money, money, money. The power of money. And it does have a power. Money doesn't need God. It has a power. And we're cowering to the, to the right of might. And I, we can remember back with Jesus. There in the, just before he was crucified, the mob, the world, world opinion, the mob chose Barabbas. And the mob continues to choose Barabbas. Mob continue. The world will always choose Barabbas. And the world will always continue to crucify Jesus. I'm sorry, mighty mob manipulation. Money or mob? And the mob's influenced by the money. And it echoes down the ages, all playing out in front of us. Maybe discernment helps you to see it a little clearer. It is so clear out there. Really, it is so clear what's going on. Cowering to the, the, the right of might. Man implementing things. Mandatory things. He's in control. Tozer said uh, that the will of the people is seldom, rarely, if ever, the will of God. The will of the people is seldom, rarely, if ever, the will of God. Evil triumphs when good men do nothing. Passivity. Passivity equals tacit agreement. And apathy is an accessory and an abetter to the crime of evil. But you know, the Bible says, if you close your eyes to sin, I will set my face against you and your family. Says God, Leviticus 20, you can go and have a look. But we're so smart, we always rationalize on the soft option. We take the soft option, we believe it's, it's wiser to do that, and we manage to convince ourselves that, that that's the way. Friends, that's denial, that's all it is. It's denial. Business and political expedience always triumphs. Comfort and compromise is king. There's no fear of God. There's a huge fear of man. We see with Ezekiel the prophet, turning a blind eye has consequences. He said, to Ezekiel, go out there and preach. We sang about Ezekiel. Go out there and preach and tell it as it is. 
If you don't speak, as I tell you, if you don't speak the truth, I will hold it against you. I will hold you accountable. Yes, you're going to have a tough time. But go and speak it. Because if you don't, I'll hold it against you. Oh, no, no, that was just for Ezekiel. That's not for us. We, we believe, I, I don't know where you find it, that there, is, that there is such a ministry as the secret agent. A lot of secret agents. The Nicodemus fraternity is still lurking in the shadows. And it's there. You all know. It's there. The big thing is you have to ask yourself whether you're part of it. You see, Nicodemus knew Jesus had something. He was impressed by the miracles and he said so. I mean, he even tried to flatter Jesus. You wouldn't do all these things unless you were special. A formula that works with human beings. But let me tell you, the Holy Spirit never tells you how good you are. And what did Jesus do with him? He switched him off. And that's how Jesus in red. He switched him off. He cut him down. Two-edged sword like the rich young ruler. There's only one answer for the Nicodemus' types. And the answer was simple. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. Bottom line, very seldom quoted. All the other stuff, especially John 3.16. You must be born again. It's not an option, Nicodemus. He said, verily, 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 I say unto you, I can't verily it enough. And when he says verily, 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 he means verily. It's not up for debate. A rock of offense in love. Jesus told it straight like the rich young ruler. I mean, there with the rich young ruler, it says the rich young ruler looked at him. And it, it talked about Jesus. That Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and it says there that he loved him. He looked at him and he loved him and he loved him enough to tell him the truth. There was no debate, no philosophy, no pandering to politics or cultures or religion. It was the straight truth. Bible is not an opinion. It's God's word. Unbelief. And the others is a monstrous sin. It's number one, right at the top. It's a problem, and dare I say it, it's a curse. Unbelief is a curse. I think one of the, the, the loveliest is Nicodemus' response when he says, How can a man be born again? Must he climb back in his mother's womb? I think that's classic. Do you know why? Because the man without the spirit sees everything in the material and the physical. The man without the spirit sees everything in the material and the physical. Man's logic is actually ridiculous. It's foolish to God. How can a man be born again? And he said, flesh gives birth to flesh and the spirit gives birth. You must, verily, 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 you must get born again. It's not an option, Nicodemus. And I mean, he even said, and, and you're a teacher? You're a teacher? This is Jesus speaking. A little bit disparaging, I think. Silly, silly me says Jesus to himself, silly, silly me, I, shouldn't, I should have known better. It's sort of hint of ridicule, dare I say that. You don't even, then he said, you don't even comprehend 
when you are talking earthly things, there is no way, said Jesus, that you will understand the spiritual things. He was a well-qualified fool. He was a well-qualified fool. Education and knowledge without wisdom. And it's all over the place. Ken Alice, Christians. You know the problem? This is a big problem. We take spiritual truth and we convert it into the material and the physical. We've done a lot of that in the modern church. Break down the temple, he said. That's the spiritual thing, and I'll, I'll rebuild it in three days. You can't rebuild a temple in three days. It's a spiritual truth. By his stripes we are healed. It's a spiritual truth. Greater things is a spiritual truth. Moving mountains is a spiritual truth. All of those are spiritual truths. Discernment. Why do most people today want the Spirit? They want power. They don't want God or anything. They want power. Power to do signs and wonders and miracles. and Power in their ministry. It's not about you and me. It's not about you and me. Flesh and gives birth to flesh and the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Through Adam, we were born dead. Through Jesus, we come alive. Thanks to mom, you're born mind, body, and dead spirit. We're born sinners. We have to be born again, born anew, born from above. And when he said that, he said to him, Nicodemus, do not marvel. Don't marvel. Why are you looking at me like that? Stop gaping at me, Nicodemus. And then finally, finally, evil hates the light. Evil hates the light. The world hates me. The world hates me, said Jesus. Go and have a look at all the religions in the world. And I'm not going to give you the answer, but go and find it out yourself. Go and see which religion hates Jesus the most. Go and find your own answer there. They hate me because I expose sin. They hate me because I bring light into the darkness. Thus says the Lord. Now, that's the gospel. John 3, that's the gospel. It is profound. It is deep. And you must read the whole thing. You can't just take one verse or half a verse. If you read the whole thing as I've shown you, it gives you a completely different view. The truth. Now the good news. Finally, the good news. Two things. Nicodemus finally came out the shadows into the light. You can read that further on. I'm not going to go into it. He came up Came out of the shadows into the light in John 7, 51 to 53. He stood up in the synagogue. So, friends, it's time for you and I to stand up in the synagogue. He claimed the body of Jesus. John 19, 39 to 40. It's time for you and I. To understand that the gospel 
is about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you. It's all about Jesus, because God has ordained it so. It's time to stand up in the synagogue. It's time to declare the lordship of Jesus, not just with your mouth, with your heart, and with the way you live. It's time to come out of the shadows. It's time. Come to me.